Hello and welcome to another episode of Two Guys in a Chainsaw. I'm Todd. And I'm Craig. Well, Craig, after doing this uh, podcast for over 300 episodes now, there is uh, hardly a franchise we haven't touched. And so we went to our patrons recently and we had asked them, uh, we, we, we we took stock of a few, uh, probably about six, I think, or so franchises that we haven't touched yet. And we said, which one should we do? And we gave them a poll. Oddly enough, to my surprise, the top of the list was Children of the Corn. Yeah, it was a surprise, too. So I guess we just either we have a lot of Children of the Corn fans or or we have people who've never really seen many Children of the Corn movies. And they just want to hear about it. Man, that could be Maybe. it. So, of course, we listened to what our patrons had to say. Uh, they do influence this show a lot. Uh, not only did we put this to them, but every time now since we uh, started this, we put forth to them a number of requests that we've gotten, and they're the ones who choose the requests. So, by the way, if you would like to choose the requests or uh, influence this show in a deeper way, answer these polls, and also uh, have access to our podcasts, often before I even get them out, because they get the raw phone calls that we do to put these shows together, and... Those are available that week, as opposed to maybe later in the week when I am able to finish editing our podcast and taking out all the stuff we don't want everybody else to hear. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, if you're interested in having access to any of that, plus a bunch of goodies and our mini-sodes uh, that we do, please go to patreon.com slash chainsaw podcast and consider being a member. So thanks again to our patrons for suggesting Children of the Corn. We're going to dive right into this franchise with 1984's movie based on uh, a Stephen King short story that showed up in Night Shift, but I believe was originally a published in Penthouse Magazine in 1977. Mm-hmm. You remember those days when magazines published... Well, do you remember the days of magazines, Craig? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, obviously, you know, in 1984, I wasn't, you know, a, a big uh, penthouse fan. but um... <laughs> A budding penthouse. I was a budding penthouse fan in 1984. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's, that's where Stephen King got his start, was writing short stories and getting them published uh, in magazines. And Playboy, Penthouse, some more reputable ones as well, like The New York or The Atlantic, et cetera. And yeah, but, but let's, I mean, let's not sell these places short. Like, pl- if you could get something published in Playboy, like that's, yeah. you know, as far as a literary magazine or whatever, I don't know, it kind of depends on how you feel. I only read it for the shories, stories and the articles. Of course, themselves. obviously. No, I mean, Pent, Penthouse, though, was, you know, kind of like Playboy's dirtier cousin. <laughs> At Play, Playboy, Playboy, you know, I, I don't know, the younger people who listen to this podcast may not realize that Playboy was a really pretty reputable publication. Oh, yeah. People were not embarrassed or ashamed to have Playboy in their homes, you know, no. people's dads subscribe to Playboy shamelessly. You know, imagine so that. It wasn't, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't uh, that big a deal. And you're right, getting something published and there was kind of a big deal. Not so for Penthouse, though. Not not so shamelessly uh, subscribing to Penthouse. That's the one you had to hide under your mattress or. That's right. That's the one that you yeah. bought at the gas station, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> But anyway, um, that's where King got his start, and I, I love King's short stories. I've, I've probably said on the podcast before that I'm a huge fan of Stephen King, period. I love his novels, but I'm particularly fond of his short stories. He's uh, very skillful, and, and he has said on more than one occasion that he continues to write short stories because he feels that it forces him to really hone his storytelling um, skills. Uh, in novels, he can meander and uh, draw things out as long as he wants to, and he does, yeah. and, and that's fine. I mean, he really does. You either like it or you don't. Some of his novels are better than others at doing this or not doing this. I don't know how to phrase it, but like, yeah, some of his novels, uh, like, like I think we talked about this, incidentally, we had a whole a mini-sode, two mini-sodes actually, devoted to uh, horror literature that we did for our patrons. We'll probably have more, and we talked about this a little bit in there, and we talked about how, I think I said in there, I was a big Stephen King fan. I've read a lot of his stuff. I like a lot of his stuff. Some of it was hard to get through. Tommyknockers was one of them. Like, 
twelve hundred plus pages of a book that was very put downable. Although I enjoyed it at, by the end of it, you know, I really liked it. I felt like yeah. it was just what he himself terms as a literary elephantism. Yeah, can't well, resist uh, you, that's... spending four or five pages telling you what this guy's thinking about as he's sitting at the bar having a, a sip of his whiskey. You know, right? The one that you just mentioned, Salem's Lot. Um, even it uh, and some others, huge casts of characters under the dome, you know, uh, huge casts of characters, many, many, many subplots, all interconnected, but lots and lots and lots to digest. In the short stories, he is forced to be more concise and uh, tell a story in shorter format. Uh, so therefore, you, you know, there's usually more focus on a smaller group of characters and, and the action is tighter. And I've read, I believe, all of his short story collections. Which one did you say this one came from? Night Shift? Night Shift. I loved that one. But there aren't as many stories in that one, I think, as, as, as some of the others. Night Shift is really good. Skeleton Crew is really good. I like yeah. them all. And I, I remember this story. I know that I've read it at least twice. And it's a good story, uh, but it's, it's grim. The film actually cheers it up slightly. <laughs> yeah, it cheers it up. allows allows for a, a much much more optimistic end. the The end of the story and the end of the movie are are very very yeah. different. And I'm we'll we'll talk about that when we get there. But you know, good source material uh, to begin with. It was a pretty low budget production, and you can tell. Yeah, uh, I read that initially they were initially they were given a budget of 1.3 million, but Stephen King got kind of pissed off because they hired him initially to write the screenplay, and he did, and the studio wasn't satisfied with it. They didn't like it. He focused too much on this the relationship between the two central characters. I think the first 30-some pages of the script, which would be you know, a big chunk of a film script was just the two main characters, uh, Bert and Vicky, in the film, played by Peter Horton and Linda Hamilton, respectively. It was just them arguing in the car yeah. <laughs> for for a, for a very, very long time before it ever actually got into any of the action. And so they hired a different uh, His name is, screenwriter... Uh... George Goldsmith. Yeah, he wrote Hill Street Blues. Uh-huh. Yeah. And they hired him and he tightened it up, changed some of the focus on to some new younger characters, <laughs> a couple of these children of the corn. <laughs> some of the children in the corn, yeah. And lightened up the tone a little bit, particularly at the end, and they preferred his screenplay and decided to go with it. That kind of pissed Stephen King off. So he demand in order to keep his name on it, uh, in order for them to be able to use his name in the advertising, because they wanted to they wanted to advertise it as Stephen King's Children of the Corn. In order to allow them to do that, he demanded an additional five hundred thousand dollars up front, which he has every right to do. It's his property, but that reduced their uh, budget to just about $800,000, which really limited what they wanted to do. Um, And they ended up having to scrap several scenes that they had hoped to film, and they didn't have much money for special effects, and it showed. Oh, God, does it show. I read an interview with with George Goldsmith where he was talking about this. He was almost a little disdainful in saying something along the lines of, yeah, so I called up Stephen King, and Stephen King, being Stephen King, was really angry, I'll just put it that way, that he was really angry about uh, rejecting my his script that had 40 pages of two people arguing in a car at the beginning. And he said to me that I don't understand horror. And I just said to him, I, I don't think you understand cinema. <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, you know, horror is gets inside of you, and in the book you can have these sort of like deep uh descriptions and and um you know you can get really inside like even just like abstract things like how oppressive is the corn you know and all these things and with the movie you 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 can't do that you've got to show everything on screen you have to have action yeah it's a visual medium yeah and and so you've got to you've got to tweak things a little bit in order to make it work i don't want to see two people arguing for 40 minutes at the beginning of this movie either no at the same time you know, I think that this worked better as a... Sh- I've read it too. I think it worked better as a short story ultimately than it did as a mu- movie. Some of that has to do with the fact that, uh, you know, the special effects are kind of lousy and some of the scenes that were deleted that had to be because, 
I'm just going to come right on and say, okay, first I want to say, I was a kid when I saw this the first time. Same. This movie freaked me out as a kid. Yep. Because of the concept. I was like, it's, it's about a town where there's this sort of religious thing happening amongst the children. And this religious thing it sort of dictates that they have to kill all the adults. And that anyone who passes the age of 18 must die. It's sort of like Logan's Run, but in horror form. And that freaked me out. I mean, I grew up pretty religious as a kid, so anything that, you know, was like religious was like, you know, spooky. And this idea of the kids sort of taking over and then, like, they're the keepers of religion or whatever. And then, you know, you, you have to die once you're, you, nobody can be an adult. Like, all that was just like, oh, freaky. Plus, the main character in this movie is freaky as hell. The two main antagonists um, are both really creepy. And the opening is very violent and brutal. I mean, it yes, it establishes, you know, it's, you know, the first thing we see is a dry cornfield. And this is clearly a very rural area. And we see this, I suppose you'd call it a flashback because it says three years ago. And we see the Grace Baptist Church of Gatlin, Gatlin, Nebraska, is where this takes place. It's a fictional city in or small town in uh, Nebraska. Um, and the title of the sermon for the day is Corn Drought and the Lord. So <laughs> apparently they have been struggling agriculturally, and um, that's a part of uh, what they're talking about with the sermon. And that also ties into what ends up going on with the kids. But we see this is, you know, before the kids have taken over. So we see all the attendees of the church leaving, adults, and there's one child narrator. Um, his name is Job. They call him Joby, which is cute. He's played by a little actor named Robbie Kiger, who I, I guess must have worked quite a bit when he was a kid, and then I left the industry, I suppose. I recognized him, though. Um, he played Patrick in Monster Squad. Oh, Okay. Um, which yeah, I love that movie, of mm. course. Um, but he's he's super cute, really small. I would guess maybe like six. I don't know, very small. Um, but he, he narrates this flashback. It was about three years ago. I was the only kid in church that day. The others were with Isaac out in the cornfield. I didn't get to go because Dad didn't like Isaac. He was pretty smart, my dad. After church, we went to Hanson's, just like always. Sarah was homesick with Mom. She'd come down with the fever real sudden. Dad was worried, so he went to call Mom first thing. That's when I saw Malachi and the others. I guess their meeting with Isaac was over. They were acting real creepy. So apparently what has happened is this young kid named Isaac has shown up in their town. It's not explained what where he came from, mm. what his origins are. But apparently he showed up and he started preaching to the kids out in the cornfield. And Job tells us that his sister Sarah is sick at home with a fever. And then everybody from church gathers at the local diner and they're sitting there and all of the teenagers in town start arriving and positioning themselves in places around the diner. And you see the teenage waitress pour something into the coffee, some sort of powder into the mm -hmm. coffee, and serve it to the guests. And then some of the elderly guests start choking and spasming and dying. Apparently the coffee was poisoned. And the other teenagers, most the the boys, just start brutally slaughtering all of the adults. Yeah. You know, slicing their throats with knives and scythes and farm instruments. And it's very bloody. And here's little teeny tiny Job watching his own father be slaughtered. Mm -hmm. And he says, this happened all over Gatlin that day. And the kids take over. We're not given a lot of exp exposition, but through observation, we come to realize that this Isaac who is played by this really interesting um, actor. His name's John Franklin. He has a really distinct look. He's only five foot tall, and he has a very childlike 
look to him. Apparently, he had some sort of illness or disorder when he was a child that stunted his growth, uh, which which led to his very short stature and led to him looking very much like a child. He's supposed to be a teenager under age 19 in this movie. He was, in fact, 24 when he played the role, and he's just kind of spooky looking. Yeah. <sighs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Cause it, it, yeah, I think... I don't know. I don't even know how to define it. He just has these sort of spooky eyes. And a distinctive kind of spooky voice. He, he looks adult without looking adult in a way. I mean, right. that's, that's it. it, right? Like, there's a there's an aspect to him that, that, that's a little uncomfortable. Like, I looked at him and I thought, this guy looks older than he's supposed to be, but he still looks like a kid, you know? It's a, there's yes. a dissonance yes. there, right? Uh, and so I think that's probably must add to it. And he's looking in the window of the diner, and he's dressed in, like, almost full Amish gear, right? He's got the black hat right. on, the black, you know, suit with a little whatever, bolero, I guess. And uh, while the, looking on and kind of grinning as these kids are, are slaughtering, clearly under his direction, the adults in there. Right. And it's not like, look, it's bloody, but it's not like we're getting Tom Savini-style special effects here, where we're seeing, like, the, the, the gore up close. No, We're no. seeing some blood splatter, we're seeing some knives drawn across necks, and sort of a little bit of the aftermath of it. But I would say it's more PG-13, except for the content. I mean, except for the, you know, the actual yeah. gore itself is pretty PG-13, whereas the the fact that these kids are slaughtering all these people brutally in there is very our territory. You know, do you know he was in Tammy and the T Rex? He was Bobby. Yeah, and he also played cousin It in the Adams Family, which you know you wouldn't see his face in that anyway. Right. But. I had forgotten that he was in Tammy and the T Rex, but I remember that we recognized him at mm-hmm. that point. And uh, I think I'm pretty sure that he returned for one of the many, many sequels oh. years yeah, and years. He later. returned for Children of the Corn six 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 Isaac's Return. fittingly fittingly it would have it would have sucked if he hadn't really yeah the gist you know basically the gist is that um isaac is the head of this religious cult of children who worship this entity that they call he who walks behind the rose and it seems to be based in Christianity, but it's like bastardized Christianity. Mm, which is spookier, right? At least to me as a kid. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, there's a blasphemy there that also makes it scary. Right. And and there's a scene later in the movie where uh, we visit the church, which was a Baptist church, and all of the Baptist religious iconography is there, but it's all been desecrated with corn. <laughs> yeah, and and the imagery has been just changed in in really grotesque and and unsettling I don't ways. Know, yeah. Uh, unsettling unsettling ways. And and I thought that that it was really effective. It was it was frightening and you know that the, just that concept I mean the just the way that religion can be used period to influence people it is pretty frightening now i'm not bashing religion i'm yeah a somewhat religious person myself i attend church regularly i'm not slamming religion but historically and arguably currently it can be used to manipulate people um, into certain practices or beliefs or whatever and especially when you take something like christianity Mm -hmm. ignore the real principal tenets of it and bend it to your will, it, it can be very dangerous. And, and that's a scary concept. And that's basically what's going mm-hmm. on here. And I think, I, you know, I don't remember Stephen King's short story well enough to remember if that was his focus. I feel like his story was really just much, was more of a monster story. This seems to be a direct exploration of the dangers of religious fanaticism or whatever. It, yes, yes. It is yes. in a way, but also like there's an actual demon involved. So it's it's not like it's there not is. like this person is manipulating these people for their own gain and their own sense of power. I mean that's happening, but there's an actual like entity behind it as well. So there is the element of the supernatural in here. And I think that's sure. that's one of the frustrating things about this movie is that that is alluded to a lot, but you rarely see it. And you really see evidence. They didn't of have it. the budget. Yeah, because they didn't have the budget. There was a, supposed to be a lot more of it. And God, like 
I hate to jump the gun here, but by the time you get to the end where this supposed demon kind of reveals itself, it kind of doesn't. No, it doesn't. Because it's just a bunch, of, it's like some weird, horrible looking special effects that it's just like an ethereal cloud kind of thing made in a camera, you yeah, know? Yeah, right. But I would say even before that, you know, you have opportunities. Like, you could sort of show the influence of the supernatural in here, but you don't really get that. Or when you do get it, it's not very satisfying at all. And I think some of that is definitely because of the budget, and some of it's just because of the way the story is structured. It spends a lot of time focusing on these creepy kids walking around murdering people or threatening to murder people, or this couple that stumbles into town. And it's just sort of, uh, I don't know, man, I just... I have to admit, I, a lot of this movie I was bored. Yeah. Thinking, oh, yeah, I guess they're trying to be creepy, but it doesn't really come across. You know, we talk about the effectiveness of the religious iconography and you know, kind of being bastardized in that church scene that comes later, which is true. That church scene is quite good. But then um, when this couple comes into town, we'll talk about that in a second, a lot of the movie is them wandering around this empty town that yeah. I suppose is supposed to be menacing, but I don't feel anything menacing about it. All I see is that dried corn stalks and pieces of corn have been stuffed everywhere, which yeah. it, which is so omnipresent that it's almost a parody of itself, and it's almost a caricature, and it kind of comes off as hokey, I think. Yeah. Okay, like, I got it, you know, the first time, but now it's just kind of feels cheap. <laughs> well, <laughs> <You know? and laughs> though they never though they never say it outright, apparently what's going on is that they have to worship this entity, he who walks behind the rose. And if they do, and if they offer sacrifices, what happens is uh, on their 19th birthdays, they sacrifice themselves. They get to uh, die. But, like, that's a, that's a great motivator, right? <laughs> well, well, right. But, like, that's how it's treated. It's treated as an honor. Like, it's your honor to be able to sacrifice yourself to this entity for the good of the town. Be- and if they do that, then they have a good harvest of corn and they can... I, I think they're like producing ethanol. ethanol. <laughs> Is this... A- yeah. Call it like yeah. these kids? Yeah, these kids are making <laughs> ethanol, which is kind of weird. <laughs> I have so many questions. You know, when you dive into the logic of this, there's so much of this that you can kind of laugh at. Like, you know, a short story doesn't have to really dive deep into the logic. It's just short and it's done and then you're you're finished. But a movie leaves you a lot of time to ponder a lot of questions. Like, what are these kids eating? (laughs) The only thing is just corn all day, every day, all the time, I guess, you know? like Corn meal, (laughs) grits. It's like is it like Forrest Gump, right? Like corn gumbo, fried corn, boiled corn, corn, <laughs> corn <chowder>. fritters. <laughs> like, they need to at least grind some wheat at some point to make some bread. I don't know. I don't like, know. Have a couple. Have some livestock somewhere. So so anyway, like we said, the the kids they murder everybody in this town, and then we jump to three years later. Except for that, the kids haven't aged. Yeah. That was funny to me. <laughs> right. No, over the course of that three years, none of these kids have aged at all. But but okay. also, like, I mean, the setup is good, right? Because you, you mentioned uh, this guy has a uh, sister named Sarah. And Sarah is in bed, but she's also, like, while she's sleeping, she's also doing automatic drawing or something like that. And she has drawn a picture to kind of foretell the slaughter at the cafe. And then uh, we get what I think actually is great music. I lo- yeah. The, the creepy score with the kids' voices on it and all that is just, it's perfect. The score throughout felt like a hodgepodge of it. it there, in times, it sounded very much like the score from Pet Cemetery. Mm. And, it, and at other times, it felt very much like the score from The Omen. Yeah. With the, the chanting in Latin. And the chanting's like cool because it's like you know it has that religious element to it, and it, that uh-huh. creepy it was used to good effect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we get that music playing over some credits of this girl's drawings, you know, in crayon, which are always creepy, right? The kids' drawings, but they're sinister, violent, uh-huh. and it kind of sets up the whole notion, the idea we see, you know, the, somebody being hauled up on like a cross of corn, and we see Isaac is sort of cre- preaching to the kids in the field, and they're standing around with knives and. They've slaughtered adults and things like that. 
Uh, and then it's three years later to the present day where uh, Vicky, played by Linda Hamilton... Right, of Terminator fame, of course. Yeah, is waking up her boyfriend, Burton, who is played by Peter... What's the guy's name? Horton. Yes, and and he's was famous for 30-something. He was in the, the TV show yeah. 30-something that was quite groundbreaking at the time. And he's done a lot. I mean, he yeah. has a bazillion credits. He directs also, so... But very recognizable. Handsome guy. These are, you know, two young actors in their prime. Yeah. Linda Hamilton just looks amazing. She's beautiful, sexy. And they're in a motel. Apparently, it's his birthday. And what's going on is they're traveling, apparently moving somewhere new because he's just finished medical school and he's moving somewhere for his internship. And she's going with them. I don't know if they're married or just... A couple. Yeah. I think in the short story, it's made clear that they're married. I don't think they're a couple because she, there's a comment made about commitment in the car that she kind of looks at him and he kind of like rolls uh-huh. his eyes at. So, And, you know, we talked about how this movie kind of deviates uh, in the story. They're unhappy and they're constantly bickering and fighting. Here, it, do, it doesn't seem that way the at opposite. all. It, it, right. They seem to be young and in love um, and and care very much about one another. And to be fair, you know, God, this is jumping back to what we were talking about before, but the, the screenwriter accused King of not really understanding horror cinema. And no disrespect to Mr. King, but I don't think the screenwriter was wrong. Right. Stephen King is 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 great at uh, writing stories and novels, but if you look, it almost feels like the more involvement that he has with his film adaptations, the less good they yeah. are. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, look at Maximum Overdrive. I love Maximum Overdrive because it's campy as hell, and I think that's super fun. Um, but it's not a great movie. No. Uh, another one another one that I'm really a fan of, but that doesn't get a lot of positive reviews, is Sleepwalkers. And, and those were mm. two that he had a lot of involvement in. The ones where he's a little bit more removed or takes a step back seem to be a little better in quality. Yeah. Um, and, and the reason that I say that is because this... <laughs> we'll talk about how this movie has like 400 sequels when we get to the end, but it also has a remake. There was a made for TV remake in 2006, I believe. And they stuck much more closely to the tone and um, plot of the story. And so in watching that, the first, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes is the couple arguing in the car. And that was boring to watch. And it made your two protagonists really unlikable characters. Yeah, like, right. who, who cares what happens to them? They seem like assholes. <laughs> so sure. I think it was the right decision to make these young, attractive, in love people. Because then you're more on their side and you care what happens to them. Yeah. So yeah, so they're, they, you know, they just, they happen through. Um, and we see that um, Job, the little boy, narrator tells us that he and his sister don't like Isaac and Isaac's henchman named Malachi who we'll talk more about they don't like him and they don't like what's going on in the town and they're not the only ones and they have a little friend um, named Joseph who's a little bit older than them and he's going to try to run away to go get help and he, he goes running through the corn of course, Job and Sarah are like, why? You're going through the corn? It's a bad idea. And he's like, well, no, it's the quickest way for me to get, well, I don't know. Or the only way. To, yeah, I, I don't it doesn't know. doesn't make sense. No, not really. <laughs> and then, you know, while he's in there, the corn starts, you know, like moving kind of supernaturally. <laughs> and uh, there's like weird, like kind of whispering or giggling or whatever. It should be creepier than it is. It's, sh- I thought it was kind of creepy and then you see that there's somebody else in the corn with him and that somebody else has a big knife and he gets stabbed or i i I think it we're told later that his throat had been cut we don't really see it we just see blood dripping onto the suitcase that he had taken with him and then the next thing we see is the couple are driving down the road and they're they're looking at a map and so he doesn't have his eyes fully on the road and at one point he looks up and that boy joseph is standing right in the middle of the road and they just plow him down god that 
honestly, the scariest part of the whole movie for me was that. <laughs> well, this is everybody's worst nightmare. They were just lucky that that boy had happened to have his throat cut before. seconds before, <laughs> right. because had had he just happened to have been crossing the road, they would have been <laughs> guilty of homicide. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Um, but, uh, they're able, <laughs> the Bert, you know, being a doctor examines him and says, something isn't right here. That boy's throat was cut. So they're able to alleviate their guilt a little bit. Like <laughs> we didn't really kill him. He was, he was pretty much dead anyway. So, but to their credit, they had to do something about it. So, you know, they know that they got to yeah. get this body somewhere and they got to grab. And they know that something's wrong mm-hmm. because Bert also finds the bloody uh, suitcase, which is a ways back in the corn. Mm-hmm. So he knows that something bad had to have happened. And he knows that blood clots within four minutes and this was still fresh. So it had only recently happened. And so whoever did this had to have been nearby. And we actually see. Um, the character of Malachi, played by Courtney Gaines, approach the car in a really menacing way. And then we see Sarah get out of the car, and she's um, scared and calling for Bert, and she goes over to Joseph's body, and Joseph is under a blanket, but his corpse sits up and lunges at her, at which point she wakes up in the car. It was all a dream. Yeah. But, well, not all, but just the the part with the boy sitting up. And they did actually hit the boy. I feel like at this point, since I've mentioned him twice, we should talk about Malachi. Malachi, the little creepy one, Isaac, is creepy. Malachi is scary. Yeah. Because he just seems sadistic. He seems to enjoy hurting people and killing people. He's played by a guy named Courtney Gaines. He's this redheaded guy who, if you were watching movies in the 80s, you'll recognize him. He actually played a really sweet character in um, Can't Buy Me Love. He was uh, uh, Patrick Dempsey's best friend in that movie. Cute, sweet, nerdy kind of character. In this movie, when I was a kid, he scared me to death Mm. like i was so scared of this kid and i read that he got he won the role because in casting he somehow got a hold of a prop knife and held one of the casting assistants hostage with it like what (laughs) that's like i wouldn't cast that kid i'd arrest him like (laughs) that's crazy right but he but he is really really scary in this movie and he says it's actually one of the things that from his career brings him the most joy that people were so menaced by this character and this performance and that he continues people continue to tell him how freaked out they were and he takes a lot of pride in that but anyway, so now they've got this dead kid. They throw him in the trunk, and they've got a they, – they just want help. Yeah. The closest town is Gatlin, and it's only supposed to be like four miles away. But they, they hit a gas station first, <laughs> and of course, the gas station guy is like – What you want to do is to go to Hemingford. About 19 miles down that right fork there. What about Gatlin? Gatlin? <laughs> there ain't nothing in Gatlin. You mean there ain't nothing in Gatlin? Well, folks in Gatlin's got religion. They don't cotton the outsiders, and they probably won't have a phone there either. Sorry, mister. I'd like to stay here and shoot the breeze with you about politics and stuff, but I got a transmission to fix. Now, you get on that right fork there, and you'll be in Hemingford in no time. Coincidentally, Hemingford is also the town that all of the people in the stand were being drawn to. Oh, interesting. There are all these there are all these connections in Stephen King's work, which is another thing that I like uh, about reading him because he gives you all these little Easter eggs for his, I don't remember what he calls us, his loyal readers or whatever he calls us. We come to find out that the, the gas station guy is, uh, he, he's basically... He's not under the influence of the kids, but he's threatened by them. Yeah, he's kind of cut a deal. Yeah. He's like the only adult around, right, who, uh, uh-huh. who, they've, who they've allowed to stick around to order to, in order to redirect people away from Gatlin. Right. And he's got a, he's such a typical Stephen King character, right? He's the, yep. he's the good old boy, you know, down-home mechanic guy out by himself, and his only companion is his dog, and he loves his dog named Sarge, and he's yeah. talking to his dog. But, uh, you know, almost like... Um, 
I, I think the idea here is that this was foretold, this was fated to happen anyway. Mm-hmm. So no matter, you know, he's doing what he's supposed to do. He's leading them away to the town. He's doing a fine job away from the town. He's doing a fine job of it. They even go, okay, they leave and they have every intention to going to not Gatlin. Right. But at the same time, the clouds are kind of rolling in and there's a big breeze through the corn. You can see the storm coming up and, you know, the dog is barking. He's at the corn. He's barking and the guy's just like uh, gets a sense of, uh, oh, you know, uh, well, he's shouting at the corn at people who aren't there, but he assumes are watching him. I told him I did everything you told me to do. He's starting to feel menaced. At the same time, the couple's driving down the road and even though they're heading toward Hemingford, the signs for Gatlin are saying three miles away, two miles away, one mile away. And they're like, somebody must be messing with these signs. Well, and and somehow they get lost and somehow they end up in the corn. They, that's like, so weird, right? Like, yeah, I, I watched this. They're on thought, a highway and then all of a sudden they're like on these dirt roads that aren't even roads. They're like Literal dirt. Vicky even says that. This isn't even a road, right? Like, it's just, so, I don't understand how they ended up in the cornfield. I think it's supposed, I think the suggestion is supposed to be that this supernatural entity is drawing them there. Like you said, this is fated or destiny or prophesied or whatever because uh, Sarah, the one who has these prophetic drawings, um, she has drawn their car and, you know, figures of them arriving in the town. They had been trying to keep the fact that she could predict the future. They had been trying to keep that from Isaac and Malachi, but Malachi catches them playing. He finds the drawing. He delivers them to Isaac. Isaac sees it and says, well, it's it's the prophecy. These outliers are going to come in um, and we're going to have to deal with them and, and sacrifice them. And so it seems like this is all faded or whatever and, and that they kind of can't get out of it. They, they end up just kind of going in a big circle. They end up back at the gas station and the guy's like, you know what? F- it. We're just gonna go to Gatlin. Yeah, it's closest. We we can't find the other one. We're just gonna go there. Can we talk about Sarah and Job for a second? Uh, I think there's a problem here. I think it it doesn't help the movie tonally that Sarah and Job, I guess, for three years have somehow evaded the rest of the kids just by staying in their own home? Well, no, I, th- I think that they are part of the kid community. I think that they just don't agree with Isaac's leadership. And so I think they just kind of go along with it but- and they sneak off. They sneak off to their family home to do things that are forbidden. Like, like paint and draw? To games. paint and draw and play games and listen to music. Yeah. Those things are all forbidden. So they So they are outwardly defying Isaac and Malachi's orders. But, but I don't understand why Malachi then sort of discovered them. I mean, what was he, was he just hunting for them for some reason? I don't know. He didn't know. I mean, I felt like Malachi... He seems to have it out for them for some I reason. I felt like Malachi, like the the impl- implication in the movie is Malachi discovers them hiding out in their home. Yeah. Because there's no other reason, you know, for him to have been in there and grabbed them and taken them to Isaac because because he's taken the Isaac like what do you want me to do with these should I should I do something to them should I whatever and Isaac's like Punish no them. let them go right yeah which makes Malachi mad right it makes him he doesn't understand why they're not being punished for do, for disobeying yeah and I think honestly like it, they're too cute. And blasé, <laughs> uh-huh. you know. Yeah. Oh, they're very blasé. For this movie, uh-huh. like the horrible things that are going on, they're they're they've been three years supposedly disagreeing, potentially in hiding from this murderous, their murderous peers in the city where their parents and all the other adults have been killed, and uh, they're just like, oh, I'm gonna draw some pictures, oh, whatever, and and even the. Very unfortunate, I think, narration, <laughs> like in the beginning of the movie. Yeah. It's so sing song yeah, weird. Like, oh, you know, it happened on this day, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes that can be unsettling itself. In this movie, it just feels dumb and out of place and weird. It, it, it kind of takes everything down a couple notches. You know, like I said, when this couple finally gets to the town and they're stumbling around emptiness you feel like, oh, God, there should be, like, sinister things around every corner, but there just isn't. And I feel the same way about these kids. Like, well, if these kids are just allowed to 
be themselves and play dress up and draw drawings and, you know, not really reflect upon or try to escape the fact that their parents and everybody have been killed and they're, they don't agree with all these murderous kids around them with this freaky religion. Like, well, it can't all be that bad, can it? <laughs> well, and that's, you know, a, you know Job um, narrates the first 15 minutes of the movie and then they drop that convention entirely. Yeah, that never happens again. You expect it never it happens again. At the end, at least, right? As a bookend uh-huh. or something, but no. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, and now we're talking, you know, up to this point, we're probably about a half an hour into this hour and a half long movie. And they finally arrive in Gatlin. And initially, like you said, it is very spooky because it's like a ghost town. Um, But we see all of these kids lurking in shadows, lurking around corners, lurking, you know, in hiding spots like the 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 couple goes into the diner that we had seen earlier and they think they're alone. But we see that there are kids lurking and they have weapons and things and they come back out and some teenagers are messing with their car. And so they they get in the car and chase the teenagers, but the teenagers evade them. And I actually did find the atmosphere of that. The rundown ghost town occupied by these sinister lurking kids. I did find that to be very creepy for five minutes. Yeah. The problem is <laughs> it goes on for the next 40 minutes. Yeah. And it's a lot of the same for, for the next 40 minutes. When they can't find anybody, they go, they say they're going to leave. They're going to try to go to Hemingford again, but they drive by Job and Sa- uh, Sarah's house. Um, and they see movement, they see a door close or something, so they stop there, they go inside, they find Sarah, she can't really tell them anything, they ask her questions, and she gives them direct answers, but with no context. So, like, where are, where are your parents? In the cornfield. Uh, are they having a meeting? No. <laughs> like, no, right. that, that's, just, that's just where all the adults are. Isaac put them there. Who's Isaac? Uh, he's the leader. <laughs> yeah. Who are you afraid of, Malachi? Like, she gives direct answers, but without any explanation. So they don't know what's going on. Like a freaking idiot, Bert looks out the window and sees Town Hall and says, You know what, Sarah? I'm just, or not Sarah, Vicky, I'm going to leave you here <laughs> with the little girl and I'm going to go check out Town Hall. And she's like, Wait, is it safe? And he's like, Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird, but it's definitely, definitely safe. Right. <laughs> like, I'm 100% confident that everything is fine. <laughs> <laughs> And so he goes there. She stays at the house. Eventually, Malachi and a group of teenagers show up, grab her, drag her out to the cornfield, tie her up to this corn cross, like a crucifixion, or, you know, erect her up next to this other cross that they had. The they blue call man. him the blue man. Yeah, it's a cop. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it, which is really obvious. I remember in the short story they talked about the blue man for a long time before you actually figured out what it was, mm-hmm. that it was a cop in uniform. And then Bert visits City Hall. I, I, I don't know, man. Like, we're busting through it because there's not, I mean, right. th- there's so little. I think this movie is a much better concept than it is a story. As a short story with limited space and limited time, it works really, really well because the concept hits you and you see a little bit of it play out and that's it and it's done. But with this movie, it just, you got to fill at least an hour and a half. And so you get a lot of walking around and sinister kids poking around but not doing anything. And and chasing. Chasing you know. is happening everywhere. And then meanwhile, the, the, I think, again, it's supposed to be sinister. There's he who walks behind the rose, like is, is written on, you know, almost like a little Bible verses or something, you know, written on in maybe blood on the wall or d- drawn in the uh-huh. dust on a car or whatever. But you look at the cornfield and it's just there, right? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's no supernatural anything happening here at all. It's just these Well, kids. there are little suggestions. There are little suggestions of the supernatural, but they're kind of lame. They're like lame. The corn right? moves a little the bit. corn moves. The dude goes into the cornfield to, to go after Vicky, and as he walks there, like the two or three stalks of corn in front of him part a little bit. Now, look, if that shit had happened to me, like right there in front of me, I'm not going to step in between it and go further into the cornfield. But he does. Right. And then... Well, he has to. I mean, he... He can just walk. 
Like, the court doesn't do anything else for a while, you know? Like, Yeah. Ugh. After he, yeah, I mean, he gets chased around town for a long time by the kids with weapons. He interrupts their ritual. You know, one of their boys has turned 19 that day and is going to be, you know, offer himself as a sacrifice or whatever. And that, that scene is very creepy. That and seems good. There's one yeah. girl. Her name is Rachel. She's a teenager. She's kind of leading the ceremony. And um, that's all very spooky. And in this moment... He kind of lectures them about bastardizing religion. <laughs> that's it's really silly, and they're it's really heavy handed. It seems to work for a second, like the oh, maybe he's right. <laughs> they never questioned this before, right? Religion's about love. You can't follow a religion that's not about love. You're bastardizing it. And, oh, come on, don't be so trite. Here. Well, he, he, there's a little bit. Of, there's a little bit of it here, and then later there's even more and it's even more heavy handed. Yeah. Um, but you know, like, so he kind of lectures them for a little while, but then Rachel kind of gets the better of him and stabs him, but he's still able to run away. Then lots more chasing. Then I feel like the, the next major part, is Malachi turns on Isaac. Now, I felt like I remembered this being much more of a thing, like the the dynamic between Isaac and Malachi and all of that. Really, Isaac is not a whole lot of a presence. No. He doesn't have a whole lot to do. Surprisingly, yeah. He barks some orders early on, but it becomes very clear, you know, pretty quickly that Malachi is beginning to question and defy him. Seize him! Punish him! Cut him down! I command you! I am the word and the giver of his laws. Disobedience to me is disobedience to him. Do it now or your punishment shall be a thousand times, a thousand deaths, each more horrible than the last! They are tired of your talk, Isaac. I have shown them what I can do. Cut the woman down. Put Isaac in her place. And all of the kids are just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so they so they cut Vicky down from the cross and put Isaac up on it. And then they use Vicky to lure Bert out, and it kind of all culminates when they all meet in the corn at dusk when this he who walks behind the rose is supposed to show up. I guess to accept his sacrifices. Yeah. Um and and in the book, in the story this is a monster. It's not described in detail, but it's a big green monster with glowing red eyes. They couldn't do it. They didn't have the budget. So instead, they kind of tried to make it an entity that could, like, control the corn and control the weather. And then maybe also it's kind of like a graboid yeah. <laughs> traveling under the dirt. They're trying hard. I mean, God bless them, really. Malachi pins Isaac to a cross and lifts him up. Uh, and Bert's out there, and then we get these cheesy animated effects on Isaac. Animated yellowishness is like crawling up his body animated. from the ground, and then he kind of explodes, I guess. In the whole well, the, cr- <laughs> the cross shoots out of the ground like a firecracker. That was cool, right? But it was it was weird. But that's out of nowhere, and then that doesn't culminate in any like. All right, you know, shoot the cross out of the ground as a firecracker, and then this entity is. I guess taking a break while you know the kid. For a second, I mean, it, it just it it's like these things happen, but then there's nothing more the entity, and it's more of these kids who could manage. It's pretty to wipe out an entire town of their of its adults, but cannot even chase down one guy. Well, right, these two guys, and Bert just bursts in and grabs Vicky and and pulls her out it's like it's nothing and um it's like it's nothing and um this is where he gives a really heavy-handed lecture about how true religion you know isn't violent or spiteful it has to be based in love (laughs) like it's but before he does that after he's freed her he looks at her he goes vicky get out of her and she kind of looks at him it's like Okay, and then she just okay. leaves, just leaves, and we don't see her again for quite a while. <laughs> and this this is the point where the story and the movie completely diverge from one another, because in the story, the kids keep Vicky on the cross, kill her, and cut her eyeballs out. Stuff them with corn and stuff, yeah. And then Bert finds her he gets killed by the monster the the he who walks behind the rose and the kid's cult just continues on but for whatever reason 
they are punished. I don't know why they're punished, but the the he who walks behind the rose punishes them by changing it so that instead of having to sacrifice on their 19th birthday, they get one less year. They have to start sacrificing on their 18th birthday. And that's cool. That Yeah, that's, I mean, it's dark. It's a typical it's, bleak, dark Stephen King ending. I, I like that. Right. I do too. For a short story, it's good. Yeah. For a movie, hmm, no. I mean, it, it potentially it could work. Bert tussles with Malachi. The se- kids all of a sudden seem to side with Bert all of a sudden, and then Zombie Isaac comes out of the right. the rose and grabs Malachi, and I guess he basically takes him out, doesn't he? At this point, and he just—it's very quick and very simple. And uh, Courtney Gaines, who played Malachi, this was his biggest disappointment because there was supposed to be a big climactic scene for his death. But based on time and budget, they just had Isaac walk up to him, grab him by the neck, and snap his neck. And it happens in a second. You barely even notice what happens. If you're not paying close attention, you wouldn't even hear the snap. And that's it. You just never see them again. And all these kids, you know, this cult of children that had taken over this town are just kids again, right? Like, they just, Uh they just, they're no longer threatening. They no longer have any aim or any whatever. They just all run away with Bert suddenly. And they're all hiding in a barn in a while barn. while the you know the weather is going and it's like oh there's insanity. I guess again the in, the idea is that he who right he's going to unleash his wrath upon them or whatever. And Bert flat out asks Job, "Hey, did any adult ever try to confront the demon before?" And he's like, "Yeah, that was the Blue Man." And yeah, and he was reading out of a page in a Bible. And oh by the way, I have that page here is in my wallet. And he pulls it out and hands it to him. Uh, and and so then from reading this circled psalm or whatever in there, they did he deducts that they need to burn the the cornfields, and once they burn the cornfields, this might kill it. So there's this whole action sequence where they run out to the gas hall that the kids have been doing and try to get the thing fitted, but they don't. They get a tube and they, they hook pull it, it up out. to the irrigation they system. Hook it up to the irrigation system so they can burn the whole field while he's running out. By the way, through the cornfield, doing all this in the cornfield, he gets attacked. By three stalks of by corn. By the corn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And it, at first, it looks all Evil Dead style, like the corn's wrapping around him and all that. But it's like three stalks of corn, which then two kids come over and just pull off of him. And he stands up like, well, that was weird. And continues to do what he was doing before amongst all the corn. <sighs> you know, it's just it's just lame. It's just lame. I know, and they they get they get the gas sprayed all over through the irrigation system, and then he makes like a Molotov cocktail and throws it, but not far enough, I guess. So Job runs and retrieves it and brings it back to him. Is like, here, throw it again, but do it right this time. <laughs> <laughs> right. Me- meanwhile, the underground entity is like chasing them i read online how they did that effect we're running short on time um but you can read online how they did that effect it was actually very practical and cool yeah it's a graboid type effect yeah Uh uh-huh but uh so you know he throws the molotov cocktail the corn goes up in flames there's this terrible terrible like animation of the spirit of the monster oh, like it was like we're going slip- up in the flames it was like slipping into japanese anime uh, you know like 80s style japanese anime with this this animation. yeah it's really it was oh, it, no. it's really really bad apparently that's it and i wrote in my notes and then the happy family walks away vicky and bert and uh the job and sarah walk away and they walk back to their car and and this was not in the original script they decided to do it at the end for one for one last jump scare and Linda Hamilton went to uh, the director I think and said we know the car is disabled why would we walk back to the car that's stupid and the response she got was yeah we want the audience to think you're stupid <laughs> <laughs> So they walk back to the disabled car for no reason, and then, I don't remember why, but Bert gets in the car just to, like, retrieve something, and Rachel, the scary teenage girl, pops up behind him with a knife for one last jump scare. And she could have very easily killed him, but instead she shouts, and he turns around and grabs her and knocks her out. And there's a funny line. He's like, she's out cold. And he's like, what should we do? And Vicky's like, we'll send her a get well card from... 
<laughs> Seattle or wherever it is they're going. And it's it's the end is so corny because the cute little kids are there and they're like giggling like, this was a fun night. And um, what are we going to do with these kids? And they look at them like, how would you like to come live with us for a night? And then Vicky's like, or how about a week? Or how about a month? And they all giggle and laugh and walk off down oh, the road together God. like they are just going to be this little happy family. Oh. F*** the other kids. Right. Like... <laughs> <laughs> there, there, are, there are two things that I, I just have to, I have to ask. I know there are no good answers for this, but number one, how did this town without adults manage to stay hidden for so long? Did none of these adults have any friends or other family members or relatives that wondered where they were and came to look for them for three years? And the second thing I wondered about is, look, this corn's got to be harvested at one point, right? Especially if they're going to make their gas a haul. That means that this field is going to be completely bare and has been at least three times. What happens to he who walks behind the rows when he doesn't have corn stalks to hide behind anymore? Yeah. You know? I don't know. It's not as sinister in the fall. <laughs> yeah, gosh, you know, I, I I remembered this movie fondly. Me too. I was really looking forward to watching this, actually. Uh, yeah, and and it started out okay. You know, I was on board for the first half hour or so, but really, once they get to the town, I was just like, God, this is slow. Like nothing is really happening. And then the climax is just really corny. It's a mess. It's a mess. <laughs> Right? Yeah, it's it's not good. It's unfortunate. Uh, you know, maybe that just said, <laughs> maybe kids would still find it really creepy. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, but children would find children of the corn creepy, perhaps. Yeah, I guess. But you know, oddly enough, this um, film has spawned more sequels than any other Stephen King property. If I remember correctly, I think there are eleven. <laughs> follow-up films there's a, um, a a horror anthology that has a children of the corn story in it that is considered canon i guess i yeah. don't know and they went off they went off in all kind of weird directions um some of them take place like in the city and like there's a like i said there was a remake um there's a i think the most recent one was a prequel i kept up with them for a while did you um back, back well back in the video store days yeah um, when a new one would just pop up on the shelves, uh, I kept up with them. They were all bad. They were all terrible. Well, we have a bit of inside information on this because every, I, you know, I was going around the internet. I was trying to, you know, get people's different commentaries on this. And almost everybody says, oh, my God, there's so many sequels. And why? Because they're all dreadfully boring and, and nobody can figure out why. But we had Bill Oberst Jr. on here. And uh, he told us why. He said the reason they keep making Children of the Corn movies is because whoever the right holder is has to do a new Children of the Corn movie every couple years or else they lose the rights to it. And so they just throw these together. And he said one of the more recent ones that were done actually was rejected. It, it, it came back and said, look, the series is Children of the Corn. In this movie, you have neglected to provide the two most basic elements that are required of a Children of the Corn movie. There are no children, and there is no corn. So if you can, so they had to actually reshoot scenes, add scenes into the movie to add children and corn in there, uh, just to satisfy their requirement of making it a Children of the Corn movie. That's how yeah. lazy it's gotten. While I was doing this research also, I saw that Stephen King had something to say about it too, and I just wanted to read his quote here. He said, Children of the Corn has generated more awful sequels than any other story in my oeuvre. There's Children of the Corn 2, 3, and 4 at least, possibly more. I eventually lost count. If my internet connection weren't down as I write this, I'd check and see if there wasn't even a Children of the Corn in space. I almost think there was. <laughs> I, the only one I was really rooting for was Children of the Corn meet Leprechaun, because I wanted to hear that little Leprechaun guy shouting, Give me back me corn! In his cute little Irish accent. <laughs> oh, I don't, yeah. I, I feel like we're just going to leave the series here, though. Oh, yeah. I absolutely feel no compulsion. I'm glad we touched upon the series so that we could talk about it. Thank you, patrons, for pointing it out to us. And 
Yeah. I hope we're not disappointing those of you who really wanted us to dive into this. <laughs> well, no, th- that's just what I was going to say. If, if if there are any of you out there who are Children of the Corn fans and there is a standout sequel, mm. um, like maybe Isaac's Return is interesting or something. Like if there if there is one or if there are a couple that really stand out, let us know because I would at least – I would watch them. Whether or not we did them for the podcast, I'd be interested in seeing if there were any that were worthwhile. I don't remember any of the ones I saw being any good, mm. but um, I think it's about time we got around to talking about the franchise. Unfortunately, uh, I I can't really recommend it unless you're just kind of a Stephen King completist, in, the, in which case, you know, whatever. It's only an hour and a half long, but um, it's really not very good. <laughs> it's really not. Well, thank you anyway, patrons, for suggesting this. We're glad that we touched upon it. If you would like to become a patron of our podcast, go to patreon.com slash chainsaw podcast. You can also find a link uh, to there from our webpage, which is twoguys.red40net.com. Leave a comment about this episode or any of the other episodes that we've done. See our back catalog. Uh, We're available there. We're available everywhere podcasts are. Um, We love to hear from you. We love to hear your suggestions of movies to do next. And we want to hear what you had to say about this episode and share us with your friends. Until next time, I'm Todd. And I'm Craig. With two guys and a chainsaw. (laughs) 